Um, before we get into the message, I need to share something with you. Um, it has come to my attention, uh, I have this on good authority, that on Sunday, February the 13th, this part of the country is set to encounter a massive snowstorm. Uh, we're talking the kind of storm that makes people want to stay home, stay home, and just be inside. Now, puts us in a very unique position because we know it's coming. We've decided to go ahead and declare that that Sunday night, when we would normally have church, we're going to declare it a snow day. Okay? Um, and as we would do on any really big, bad, horrendous snow day, we've already decided there will be no church that night. So from this point on, whenever you hear February the 13th, just think snow day. Do you understand my drift? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Do you like that? You like that, Dan? Uh, no. Uh, for all the rest of you that don't have a clue what I'm talking about, uh, that is also known as Super Bowl Sunday. And we will be without most of our setup people, our cleanup people, as well as workers in our children's program, our video team, our sound team, our production people. Most of them will not be here which means that we would be at a very great loss to try to do that. So we are not going to meet that night. Uh, we plan to provide you, if you're going to be a part of a Super Bowl party or something somewhere else, uh, we will have for you by next week, we will have a devotion uh, if you want to share that wherever you are with your friends or family. Uh, we are going to pre-record the sermon for that night so that you can uh, watch it any time that you want after Sunday night. Uh, we'll, we'll give it online and then, uh, yeah. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say is that you can give online if you want to. Uh, you can also mail your offering in. Uh, but the kind of key thing, since we're not going to be meeting that night, is first of all, I'm trusting that you're all going to be here next Sunday night, right? Yeah. February the 6th. Okay, you're going to be here, and uh, then be back with us on February the 20th, which you just heard tonight is our chili cook-off night, and so we'll be having worship after that. So uh, I just thought, you know, since schools take snow days, you know, and a lot of times they do it well in advance of any storm that actually comes, uh, we would just create our own snow day, okay? So some of you are not amused. I look at your faces. I, I, it, it is a wonder that I can ever finish a sermon in this group because sometimes your lack of expression stymies me, okay? Uh, and uh, I'm, just, I'm just letting you know in case you were curious. You weren't even curious, were you? Uh, okay, take your Bibles, please. Tonight we are going to be in Mark chapter 10. Uh, I'm going to read for you verses 17 to 22 in just a minute, as well as verse 27. Uh, this is the story of the rich young ruler. Uh, some of your Bibles may actually say rich young man, uh, but uh, we're going with the one I grew up with. He was called the rich young ruler. He approaches Jesus and he wants to know one thing. What does he have to do to inherit eternal life? And there should be warning sounds and red flags going off all around you with that question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Let's jump in here. Mark chapter 10, beginning in verse 17. It'll be on the screens as well. As Jesus started on his way, a man came up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And we don't have a problem with that, just from our vantage point, but a good Jewish man would never speak to another man and call him good. Because that was a phrase, that was a word that was reserved for God. And so we got a problem here uh, that this young man is already uh, crossing the line. So he asked what he has to do to inter in inherit eternal life. Verse 18. Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. Verse 19. You know the commandments. 
You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Verse 20. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Really? Yeah. Would you want to get up in front of people and make a statement like that? It's, it's, um, verse 21, Jesus looked at him and loved him. I think Jesus loved everybody that he looked at, but he does make a point here of saying it. One thing you lack, Jesus said, go and sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven, then come follow me. I don't think this guy heard anything past, go sell everything you have. I really don't think he heard the rest of the statement. Um, you're going to have treasure in heaven, then come follow me, verse 22. At this, the man's face fell. And you kind of have an image of that, don't you? You've seen somebody go from happy to incredibly sad and depressed in a very short period of time. It says, he went away sad because he had great wealth. And then let's jump on down to verse 27, and we'll uh, talk about this here in just a minute. Jesus looked at them. He's talking to his disciples now. I'll tell you what they said that prompted this. Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible but not with God. All things are possible with God. This is part five of our series called Hostile. Throughout the series, we've been learning that there's an incredible difference between religion and Christianity. And every week, I've been kind of reminding you of this. Tonight's, it's going to be a little more concise because I've got some other things I want to talk about. But religion is all about keeping a moral code. In fact, you check this out. Every religion in the world is about keeping a moral code. Every one of them. Except for Christianity. Christianity is not. Christianity is about a gracious God who saves people who fail to keep the moral code. Religion is about me and my transformation. When I use that word, do you understand what I'm talking about? When I say my transformation, what, what am I referring to? Pardon? Okay. Um, yeah, you guys are all kind of coming around the sides at this. My transformation would be like saying my life change. Okay? So, um, Religion is all about me and the changes that I need to make, which is what you guys were getting at there. Uh, Christianity is all about Jesus and his substitution. You've heard us use that word before. Substitution in what, what way? Where did he go that he didn't need to go? To the cross. Who did he go for? All of us, exactly. So religion is about me and my work for God. Christianity is about Jesus and his work for me. Last week I told you that the goal of Christianity is not to make you a better person or to make you sin less. That is not the goal of Christianity. Most people assume that is what the goal of Christianity is, but that's not it. That's not the goal, okay? The goal of Christianity, go ahead and put this up here. The goal of Christianity is to give you Christ. And I think we gave that to you last week. I want to deliver to you the blood of Jesus, the forgiveness of Jesus, the righteousness of Jesus, and the forgiveness of Jesus. I, I, that's the goal of Christianity. And the reason why Christianity is not about us getting better or sinning less is because even if we got better, and even if we sinned less, those things don't solve our deepest problem. So, now just go with me here. We say things in our culture like, well, nobody's perfect, right? And we say it as if that's okay. Well, nobody's perfect, so, you know, we'll, we'll cut you some slack, or I'm asking you to cut me some slack. We have so normalized imperfection that we don't see it as the eternal catastrophe that it is. 
Stay with me. Now, do not be offended by what I'm about to say, but it's the absolute truth. God damns imperfection. Yeah, some of you didn't get past the second word. I know that, you know. God damns imperfection. So I think we could say imperfection is not a joke to God. We shouldn't feel better about ourselves uh, by simply saying, well, nobody's perfect, you know, as in that's supposed to give me some slack. And this is, this is something that I think we understand, but I want to try to go there for a little bit tonight. Um, God demands perfection, not goodness. He demands sinlessness, not sinning less. So in light of God's command for us to be perfect, simply becoming a better person doesn't help. It doesn't solve our greatest problem. Christianity, on the other hand, is all about solving the deepest problem that we have in the human condition. Getting better, sinning less, doesn't solve the ultimate problem. We need somebody, and by the way, we can't solve it. We need somebody to do for us and give us what we cannot do or get for ourselves, no matter how hard we try. Christianity announces that that someone has come. That's really what it's all about. That's what we're here to talk about tonight. This is what I want us at some point to be able to share with other people. The whole thing, Christianity, the whole thing is about Jesus and what he's done. It's about his substitution. Because if we really look at our lives, you just think about yourself right now. If we really look at our lives carefully, what we'll probably discover is that our transformation, our life change, hasn't happened as fast or as much as we hoped that it would. It's not like take a pill, poof, overnight, you're a super Christian. Don't you wish it worked that way? I'm not even going to say that because I think there's so much to be learned by the process that we go through, even though the process is not always uh, very exciting. As I look back through the course of my short life, <laughs> that wasn't even meant for a laugh. You know, okay. As I look back, we'll just leave Alita out of this. Over the course of my life, I realize that I've gotten better at some things and I've gotten worse at others. You feel the same way? And in a lot of the things in my life, I'm basically the same. There's not been a lot of change. When I feel convicted about the ways that I've gotten worse, it actually shows me that I've gotten better. Are you with me? Okay. And when, okay, one more time, because you're not going to be able to write it all down. When I feel convicted about the ways that I've gotten worse, it actually shows me that I've gotten better. Okay, I get worse, I'm convicted about it, that means I'm getting better. Now, on the other side, when I feel proud about the ways I've gotten better, it actually shows me I've gotten worse. And this whole thing could just cycle around and around and around she goes and where it stops nobody knows and, and let's be honest our change the change that we are going through what God is trying to do in us is not as glorious as maybe we think it is and even if it was that glorious we still need something bigger than just the little changes that happen in our lives we're back to what I said a moment ago we need a substitute I'll say it again because I want you to get this in your head. We need somebody to do for us what we could never do for ourselves. And it's Jesus' work for us, not our work for him, that makes us right with God. It's his perfection, not my improvement, that makes me right with God. So, the answer to our lack of perfection is not to rejoice in imperfection. 
oh, well, everybody does it, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, it's, we, we, we kind of make it out that imperfection is not a big deal. The answer to our imperfection is to rejoice in Jesus' perfection for us. Jesus is perfect for us because you and I could never be perfect. However, because of his perfection, we are made right with God. We are clothed in God's pardon because of what Jesus has done. Our deepest problem has been solved. Not because we got a little bit better, but because of what Jesus has done for us. He has, here's the biblical word, justified us. He has treated us just as if we had not sinned. Now, in the story that we read just a moment ago, what Jesus is really pointing out is that if Christianity is all about goodness, then we're all in a big pile of trouble. Are you with me? If Christianity is all about goodness, we're all in deep doo-doo. If Christianity is about our improvement, or our goodness, or our ability to sin less, then we're all in big trouble. It's interesting to me, the response, and I think I can say this tonight because I don't think that any of you fall into this category, although I may find this to be true. Um, there are certain things I say when I'm preaching. That some of them are things that I've said since pretty much the start of the crosswalk that uh, get some kind of response from people, not always positive. Uh, for instance, things like God only uses broken people because broken people are all there are. Okay? I've used that many, many times, and invariably there will be at least one person in the room who frowns at me when I say that. To which I want to say, seriously, doesn't human history prove that we are not nearly as good as we think we are? So God uses broken people because there really aren't any other kind. Or when I, I make this statement, we'll never know how good God is until we realize how bad we are. You know? Again, uh, there's just something about the sound of that that some people just kind of look at me like... <laughs> some of you are making faces at me like long, sad, yeah. I just know some people don't like the sound of that. I, I think what has happened, especially in our culture, is that we are addicted to needing to believe that we are good. We really want to believe that we are good. We're almost to the point of being addicted to it. And part of the issue is, is the way that we tend to look at the word good. Let's, just, we, let's focus on that word for just a minute. Some of this has to do with the way we look at that word in terms of what we do and what we don't do. So in that sense, in terms of what we do, we might call ourselves good most of the time. Not all of the time. We're not that vain, are we? We're not that vain, are we? Okay, thank you. Now, let's talk about this, you know, I, I'm a pretty good person. We care about people, we, can, we, we love our families, we help people when and where we can, we don't break the law except when we're driving, you know, just... <laughs> yeah, okay. I knew there would need to be a confession time tonight. Um, we tend to think that we're nice, and we're actually pretty friendly, this group is that, and, and those of us who know best, know us best, would probably agree with us that we are pretty nice people. I've always been impressed with, um, what am I wanting to say? That word just, poof. Generally at funerals, I'm handed a piece of paper that have all the information about the person that just passed. And I'm supposed to read that information. What do we call that? Obituary. An obituary, thank you. Um, I'm amazed. Uh, it's generally not so much in those words, but then it's in the words of the people who follow that, who want to say a word, you know? And, and my thing about this, can I just say this? If somebody gives me the opportunity, there will be no extra words at funerals, okay? That, that's just a personal thing for me. There don't need to be words. I have seen people open their mouths and get in so much trouble with all the relatives in the room, they should have kept their mouth shut. Things would have been so much better. Um, 
But it amazes me as I listen to their little, I don't know, what do we call them, eulogies, little things like that. I'm amazed at how saintly that person was. Because in some cases, I knew that person. And I failed to see what just got mentioned. You know what I'm talking about. Okay, so understanding what I'm talking about, how do we reconcile this, what we're talking about right now, this definition of good, because we would all think of ourselves as fairly good people, we, our friends are pretty good people, how do we reconcile that definition of good with what Jesus says in this passage when he says no one is good but God? And I don't think there can be any confusion about what he said. He was very clear in it. And, and later on, I think we have a slide for this, Romans chapter 3, verse 10. The Apostle Paul is thinking, of, probably thinking about the same thing, when he says there is no one righteous, not even one. And then you jump on down to verse 12, and he says the same thing. There is no one who does good, not even one. So how do we reconcile this understanding of goodness from Scripture with the ones that we have, for the most part, you know, hey, I'm a pretty good guy, she's a pretty good girl. How do we reconcile all of that? Well, the answer lies in what we usually mean when we use the word good and what God means when he uses the word good. The way that you and I would normally define good has to do with what a person does and does not do. So a good person is someone who does the right thing. A good person is someone who avoids the wrong things. A bad person is, is that one who does the wrong things and avoids doing the right things, okay? So a good person is someone who is nice and kind, and a bad person is somebody who's selfish and mean, okay? That's basically, typically the way we understand good and bad. It's based on what we can see, right? A person's conduct, what they do. So when one of your kids does something bad, we tell them, you're bad. You know, you're bad. Or when they do something good, we say, you're good. You know, got that from your dad, didn't you? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or if you're bad, we know where that came from. But in this passage, Jesus reveals the way that God defines goodness. And that goodness is very different than the one that we're talking about. Jesus cuts through the outer behavior of a person and looks at the heart. And he exposes what is in a person's heart. And he does it in this story by hitting him right where it hurts. Now the first thing I want you to notice, and I hope you still have your Bibles open, the first thing I want you to notice is the rich young man's question. That's in verse 17. Can we put that back up here? Verse, it's a good teacher. What must I do to inherit eternal life? His question is religious to the core. Okay? Uh, it's, it's like, I don't, we're not going to turn to this, but over in John chapter 6, Jesus' disciples come to Jesus and they ask this question, uh, what must we be doing to do the works of God? That's kind of an interesting question. What, what is it that God wants us to do? What kind of works? What kind of actions? And, um, and Jesus says basically to them, do you want to know? Do you really want to know? And they're like, yes, we want to know. Uh, and they're getting all excited because Jesus is getting ready to give them a checklist of things to do to ensure that they're doing the works of God. That's what they think. Would you agree that that's what Jesus is about to do for them? No. In a remarkably anticlimactic way. Jesus says, if you want to know what you should be doing to do the works of God, then believe in the one who he sent. Jesus said, that's it. They're going, okay, we got pencil and paper here. I'm going to write down my checklist. I'm going to make my boxes. Okay, what are we supposed to do? Jesus says, if you want to do what God's called you to do, then believe in the one he sent. Who's that? Jesus. Jesus, yes. It's always a safe answer when you're not sure. Say Jesus, okay? 
Anytime we begin a conversation, or anybody does, with what must I do, God, I think, has ways to reminding us of reminding us what he's already done. And I think that's a key thought for us today. We may say that God's love is unconditional. Would you agree with me on that? We've studied that before. We say that God's love is unconditional. But, let's be honest, we still assume that there's something we have to do to earn it, functionally speaking. Okay? Even though we believe in the statement that his love is unconditional, we still believe, let's be honest, that we must do something to earn his love. You know, God's going to bless me if I'm good. God's going to love me more if I obey. I'm going to inherit eternal life if I do enough of the right things. We assume that on those days when we are being good, do you, you have those? Where you're being good? We assume on those days that God loves us more. And then on those days when we're being bad, we assume that God loves us just a little bit less because we really ought to be good. That's the way we assume God is. Why? Because that's the way everybody else is. We take a cue from humanity and we put that characteristic on God. And since everybody else in our lives is conditional, we assume that God is conditional too. And the unconditional nature of God's love and acceptance messes with us. By the way, it doesn't mess so much with us as it does with our view of somebody else. You didn't go there with me, did you? We said his unconditional love messes with us. It's not so much that God unconditionally loves us. I just can't hardly believe that he loves you. <laughs> Seriously, we have a problem with that, okay? Now, Jesus could have said to this rich young ruler, he could have said, hey, listen, buddy. There is nothing you can do. In fact, it was humanity's doing that created this mess in the first place. And the reason that I had to come is to undo everything that you've done. He could have said that, but he didn't. Okay? Jesus, what does he do? He starts listing off some of the Ten Commandments. Does he give all ten? No, he gives six of them. And I've read in the commentaries this week about why he chose the six that he chose and, and would, what about the ones that were left out and nobody really knows for sure. But I think it was enough of a list so that the guy's going to go, yep, he's listening to Ten Commandments, got, it, got that all figured out. And the guy's response, honestly, is laughable. Got it, Jesus. Got it. I have been doing that since I was a little kid. Come on, Jesus. Give me something that's hard. I mean, this guy's going, yeah, okay, Jesus, come on. Now, if I were Jesus, oh, that's dangerous, isn't it? <laughs> I would have looked at him and said, are you kidding me? Seriously? I just walked you through six of the Ten Commandments and you have the audacity to say to me that you've been doing those pretty much perfectly since you were a kid. I, I, you're telling me that ever since you were little, you've just been doing everything right? I think Jesus could have started in on him with the Sermon on the Mount. I think he could have gone from there to something else. Jesus could have said, it's real simple, buddy. Be perfect as your Father in Heaven is perfect. Jesus did say those things, didn't he? Now, there are things that I would have loved for Jesus to say to put this guy in his place. Yeah? Things like, hey, you, love perfectly. <laughs> sacrificially. Selflessly. Not just on the outside, but on the inside too. In other words, you must always want to love perfectly. To sacrifice and to be selfless. Jesus could have said what that means, rich young ruler, is never hurt anyone. Physically, emotionally, or relationally. In fact, you can never want to hurt anyone physically, emotionally, or relationally. It's not enough that you don't hurt anyone on the outside. You must never even desire to hurt anyone on the inside. And you must always help everyone. 
And you must always want to help everyone. How are we doing so far? I think that's what Jesus should have said to this guy. You know, come on, ring him up good. Um, this young man, I think, was pretty full of himself. Um, Jesus could have said all of that and much more, but he didn't. What he says, which goes in such an opposite direction, is, hey, why don't you sell all your possessions and then give everything to the poor, your house, your car, your boat, everything, even your camel. You know that's going to be on the list. Right, okay? Jesus wants to make one point very clearly here. To be in with God requires total perfection. Sinless devotion, untainted faultlessness, unbounded sacrifice, and absolute generosity. And the passage says that when the young man heard this, he went away sad. Because what was the word you used just a moment ago, Anita? Impossible. That's what was going through his mind. Now what we didn't read is what happens next with the disciples. Um, Jesus' disciples see this guy leave and they come to Jesus and they're going like, Whoa, time out here. Um, how is anybody going to get in if that's the qualification? Your answer to that guy was to like walk through the Ten Commandments and then tell this guy to go sell everything and give to the poor. If that's what's required, then who can do it? And we have Jesus' answer in verse 27. Look with it again. Look at it again with me. Jesus looked at them and said, With man, this is impossible. But not with God. All things are possible with God. God. What he's saying to his disciples is, you're right. It's impossible for you to do this. In other words, that's the whole reason I'm here. With man, it is impossible, but it isn't with God. With God, all things are possible. God makes us right with God. We don't make ourselves right with God. God justifies us. We don't justify ourselves by what we do or what we don't do. Now, interesting thought. Had the rich young ruler stuck around to hear the conversation with the disciples, which, by the way, was the only news that would really set him free, with man it's impossible, but it's not impossible with God, at that point, I think the rich young ruler might have fallen on his face and said, Oh, Jesus, I am so sorry. I spoke of things I didn't understand. You made it very clear that there is nothing I can do to inherit eternal life. So I think his next question would be, so where does my hope come from, good teacher? And Jesus would have been saying, it comes from me. At that point, I think you would have heard Jesus say just what he said, with man it is impossible, you can't do it. And, and what I would have added in here is, wrong question, dummy. Jesus didn't use words like dummy, did he? He lets me use those words. Yeah. What can I do is always the wrong question. The right question is, what has Jesus done? Instead of what can I do, it's what has Jesus done? That's the question that when answered rightly, puts us right with God. Think about this. The one who is good. The only one who is good came to do for us what we could never do for ourselves. This one, this only one who is good came to meet our failures with his forgiveness to the tune of 70 times 7. He came to meet our guilt with his grace. He came to meet our mess-ups with his mercy. He came to meet our exhaustion with his rest. The one who is good, the only one who is good, came to pay our tab in full and to clothe us in a straight jacket of righteousness. He came to free us from the need to prove ourselves. Isn't that incredible? I do not have to prove that I am worthy. I do not have to prove that I am lovable. 
I don't have to prove that I'm good. We could put it this way. Standing before God, the goodness of God is all we have. And his goodness is all we need. It is the goodness of God that is saving us. And that's all we have, and that's all that we need. And our hope, right here at the crosswalk, our hope, our prayer as a developing community would be, I want to be a place where people feel the freedom to tell the truth about themselves without fear of rejection. I don't want anybody to walk out these doors and feel like they have not been accepted by the other broken people and sinners that are in this room. Amen? Amen. We want people to feel the freedom to take off their masks and not pretend. Oh, I don't know about you, but I feel so sorry for people who are pretenders. It's a great Jackson Brown song, okay? But it's just... Some of you? Yeah. Some of you are going, who's Jackson Brown? No. I can't believe some of your musical knowledge or lack thereof. We want people to not pretend that they're better than they are, and we want this place to be a place of recovery. We want to have all kinds of broken people come here to figure out how do I live in a broken world as a broken person. That's why I've never been ashamed to tell you what happened to me and my story. Uh, partly because I cannot expect you to be willing to tell your story if I'm not willing to tell my own. Did I do things that I regret? Absolutely. Have you done things that you regret? I hurt people. It hurts me very much. You have hurt people. We all have guilt and shame that we need to deal with. Listen to this, please. If everybody knew about us, everything that God knows about us, we would run for the hills. Absolutely. And as I wrestle with this, and I hope that you wrestle with this too, as I wrestle with what I went through, I've discovered there's basically two ways to deal with this. The first is to convince myself that others have done much worse than I did and convince myself that even though I'm not perfect, at least I'm better than those people. They're, I'm messed up, okay? But they're really messed up, okay? I mean, who doesn't mess up, right? Do you mess up? Or nobody's perfect, and right? Should that make us feel a whole lot better? No. I've tried it, and it doesn't really make me feel any better. And <laughs> yeah, you see, I know the truth about myself. And if you're willing to be honest, you know the truth about yourself. That's the first way that we try to deal with these feelings. The second way is to accept the fact that I am not good. According to God's definition, I am not good. But I also believe that God was good for me. This is such an important concept for us to get. So you got it? There's two ways for us to deal with this. We, we can either compare ourselves to someone else who's worse than we are, or we can accept the fact that we're not good. What do we call that? Owning it. And agreeing with what Jesus says here. Agree with the fact that Jesus says, there is no one good but God. And that includes me and you. We agree with the Apostle Paul and what he said in Romans 3. There was no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who does good, not even one. And if that makes you feel uncomfortable, and it makes me feel uncomfortable, what that reveals is how much we have built our identity on appearing to be good. That little thing that gets real uncomfortable inside of us when we kind of tell a half-truth or we kind of bend the story a little bit to make us look better than we are. That little thing inside of us that's uncomfortable is our idol being exposed. The idol called me. Don't tell me I'm not good. I've built my whole life on believing that I'm good or at least thinking I'm better than that person. See, the first option of comparing yourself, it doesn't deal with reality. So there's no way that it sets you free. 
because it just hides the truth and it ultimately leaves us sad, which is what was said about the rich young ruler as he walked away. He went away sad. The second option, which is agreeing with Jesus that we are not good, is accepting the truth about us, accepting what the Bible says about us. And it opens us up to the mind-blowing, heart-warming, impossible truth about God that because Jesus succeeded for us, we are free to fail without fearing that God will ever stop loving us. If our standing before God is based in any way, shape, or form on our goodness, then we are building on sand, people, and the storm is coming. One wave can come and knock all that down. You say, oh, well, well, pastor, you got such a low view of yourself. No, I don't. It's just that I know I'm free. I don't care what you think of me. And that's called freedom. Why? Why can I be that way? Because my life is based on what Jesus did for me, not what I did. So God's love and God's acceptance and God's approval, it's all ours and forever. And that means if I tell you the truth about me and it scares you away and you reject me, I really haven't lost anything. Because we can stomach the rejection of others because we will never have to deal with lovelessness or rejection from God. That's what sets us free. God knows everything about us. I am convinced that if you and I could just sit with that one for like four or five days in a row, just that line, God knows everything about us, I'm not sure where we would end up with that. It's an interesting thought. God knows everything about us, and yet because of the work of Jesus Christ, he loves us unconditionally. He accepts us fully. And finally, and, and you, I, I like this. I don't know. I just like this. God approves of us. Ooh, I like the sound of that. And we will one day hear those words. I'm counting on it, by the way, okay? Well done, good and faithful servant. Not because of what we've done, but because of what Jesus has done for us. Hear me. We're in forever because of what Jesus has done for us. And that makes us appropriately dangerous. If they can't hurt you, watch out. It gives us a holy boldness. It gives us a certain amount of courage that we didn't have before. The second option, which is really the only option that makes us free, it's to remember. Christianity is not for good people who try hard. It's for bad people who finally give up and throw themselves on the forgiving mercy of Jesus Christ. Let me say that one more time. Christianity is not for good people who try hard. So whatever you think about yourself, you probably need to change some of that assessment right now. It's for bad people who finally give up and throw themselves on the forgiving mercy of Jesus Christ. Why? Because he's the only one who said, come to me. All you who are tired and burdened, and I will give you rest. Our worth, our value, our significance, our identity, it's all ultimately anchored, not in what we do, but in what Jesus has done for us. I want to close tonight with a quote. It's a little bit of a lengthy quote from Robert Capon. Uh, we've used him several times when we get into talking about grace because he's, he's written so much on the subject. Uh, let's go ahead and put that up here. I'm going to read it to you. It's longer than that screen. He says, Christianity is not a religion. That's what we've been trying to show you for the last five weeks, okay? Christianity is not a religion. Christianity, in fact, is the announcement of the end of religion. Religion consists of all the things the human race thought it had to do to get right with God. But if the cross is the sign of anything, it's the sign that God has gone out of the religion business and solved all the world's problems without requiring a single human being to do a single religious thing. Ooh, that sounds freeing. 
The church is not in the religion business. It's in the gospel proclaiming business. And the gospel is the good news that all of our fuss over our relationship with God is unnecessary. Because in Jesus, God has gone and fixed everything himself. Amen? I want to be that free. I want you to be that free. Did, did, the, did it not go when it was supposed to go? Can we start over? You can take pictures. I'm going to read it again because I just liked what it says. And we'll try to go as slow as we can. Do you go back to the very beginning? Christianity is not a religion. Christianity, in fact, is the announcement of the end of religion. Religion consists of all the things the human race thought it had to do to get right with God. Okay? But if the cross is the sign of anything, it's the sign that God has gone out of the religion business and solved all of the world's problems without requiring a single human being to do a single religious thing. The church is not in the religion business. It's in the gospel proclaiming business. And the gospel is the good news that all of our fuss over our relationship with God is unnecessary because in Jesus, God has gone and fixed everything himself. Amen? Would you bow with me please for prayer? Father in heaven, what, uh, what a story. I know a lot of us have looked down on this young man, but I hope maybe now we have a little bit more understanding of what he was ask, actually being asked to do. And Father, I, I know there's another lesson here, and that is maybe we shouldn't be so quick to walk away when things don't go our way. Because if he'd stuck around, he might have heard the greatest news he'd ever heard before. If he'd stuck around, he might have been free. Father, that's what we want, is we want our freedom. Some of us are still wrestling with this whole thing about perfection. Perfection. Because we've been taught all our lives that that was to be our goal. Is that we were supposed to try to be perfect people. And we can't be. So Father, we turn it over to you. And what you've done for us. What Jesus has done for us and is continuing to do for us. Father, lead us to freedom. In the name of Jesus, we pray this. Amen. Thank you for being here tonight.